Welcome to Biblical Insights with David Gooding, a Myrtlefield House podcast. When we study scripture, we ask two basic questions. What does it say? Why does it say it? What I'm doing, therefore, is looking for what I would call the thought flow. This is not just a philosophical theory. There's gospel actually works. Let me tell God what I think of God. Let God pay all so long as God be mine. Paul's epistle to the Colossians reminds us that ultimately Christ is all we need. He is our initial salvation, our growth and sanctification, and our final glorification. Studying Colossians reminds us of our status as God's children, showing us how to walk with Christ while avoiding the enemy's pitfalls. In this episode, David Gooding looks at what Paul says about the Lordship of Christ and the effect that is to have on marital, parental, and even slave-master relationships. Addressing the objections made against these verses in Colossians, he reminds us of the vital importance of obedience in the grand scheme of God's plans for us. Look, if you will, please, at uh, chapter 3, in verse 18, we are told, Wives, be in subjection to your husbands, as is fitting in the law. Or again, verse 20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing in the Lord. Or again, in verse 22, servants, obey in all things them that are your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing the Lord. Moreover, whatsoever you do, work heartily as unto the Lord. Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you shall receive the recompense of the inheritance. You serve the Lord Christ. Chapter 4, verse 1, Masters, render unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master. Yes, but it's the same Greek word as the word for Lord. Knowing that you have a Lord in heaven. Let's be honest with ourselves. These verses, and particularly those that uh, concern themselves with husbands and wives, are felt in many a circle to be somewhat offensive. Survivals from the age of male chauvinism. And if I were to expound them too much, I might easily be dismissed as somebody who, for lack of experience, doesn't know what he's talking about. Let us help ourselves, if we can, by the observation that if moves and developments in modern society have made some of these biblical precepts appear to be offensive, even when they were given to certain classes, they would have been very difficult to take. Imagine being a slave under an unreasonable slave master and being told you have to obey that master and submit to him not only to the good, but also to the difficult and froward, for this is well-pleasing in the Lord. And to be told that for Christ's sake you are expected to submit, rather than listening to the message of those that would have provoked the slaves to disobey their masters and try to get their freedom by force. In other words, these precepts have not always been light and sweetness to everybody. To some people, they have always seemed offensive. Let us, therefore, help ourselves as we face them by certainly being considerate one for another, but remembering what this epistle has taught us. The precepts about how the lordship of Christ is to be worked out in family and business, pray let us remember, do our best to remember, who that blessed Lord is. He is the first of all creation. He is the first of redemption, who for our sake, sinners though they were, bore the pains of the cross and gave his life for us. If anybody has a right to talk and to lay down the rules and the regulations, who of us would be willing to dispute the rights of the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ? Secondly, let us therefore notice the groups themselves. The three groups 
that the apostle mentions here in which the lordship of Christ is to work itself out. Wives and husbands, children and parents, slaves and masters with their modern-day analogues of servants and employees on the one side and employers on the other. And did I hear my good uh, Christian women folks? say, but look what the man has done now, if that isn't the most offensive thing that ever he ever said, Jaw say. Do you mean really to group the wives with the children and the slaves on the one side? Wow, what an insensitive thing to go and do. Women group with the children and the slaves, and the husbands bless them with uh, the masters and the rulers. Isn't that a summing up of the offensiveness of the whole business? Well, I didn't write it. It's my first line of defense. I'm merely pointing out what the apostle has written. And secondly, let's not jump to too many conclusions. Yes, the good ladies are here if they are married women on this side of the fence, so to speak. On the side and in the groups whose virtue it is to obey. But, of course, when it comes to this second group, the ladies are on the other side, aren't they? Included in the parent. Yeah. And when it comes to the third group, not all ladies are on the left-hand side, and all gentlemen on the right, of course not. Some ladies could be on the right-hand side, couldn't they? You will remember that delightful encomium of the virtuous woman at the end of the book of Proverbs. Delightful picture of that masterful woman who rose up before it was daylight and organized the house and organized the household servants and gave them each their task and run what would have in those days been quite a large domestic establishment with not husband and children only, but all sorts of servants and slaves. And having organized the household, then she went down to the marketplace and saw a field and she bought the field and was in quite a big way of business. And therefore mistress over the slaves, men and women. And you will remember the story in the New Testament of Lydia, who was in the fashion business and was in uh, Philippi, though she was born in, in, in Thyatira, because the material she sold purple was very expensive and therefore she was in Philippi where people normally had a lot of money and could afford to buy expensive clothes. And she was there, head of an establishment of importers and wholesalers and retailers, you'll say, and had doubtless many servants and some slaves, maybe, under her control. And of course it is still true, isn't it? It's never more true in modern society, from the nursing sister in the hospital who has the other nurses under her command. Or do you see the school teacher or the uh, company secretary? There could very well be a woman. So that should redress the balance just a little bit, isn't it? It is not everywhere and always that the women folks are on this left hand side of the divide, you say, and the men on the right, far from it. There could be situations where the good lady would be the master and the gardener, who she has every right to control is a man. Yes, apparently, when it comes to wives and husbands, then the Holy Scripture regards it as fitting that a woman should submit to her husband, whatever that means. If women folks should feel that that is offensive, all I can say as a theoretical uh, theologian is to observe that for our sakes, our blessed Lord, being equal with the Father, was pleased not to grasp hold of that position, but humbled himself and became a servant, and took God as his head, and became obedient unto death. It is that blessed Lord who learned what it cost to obey, that is, asking Christian why, to submit to their husbands. And we might go further along that line, mightn't we? Suppose, my dear Christian woman, you had been the Virgin Mary. 
the creator of all things now become incarnate, given to your charge. It is written of him that when he went home, he was subject to his parents. And if you had been the virgin, the blessed Lord Jesus would have been subject to you. This is not a Lord who lays down commands without knowing what they mean. He first practiced what he preached. Isn't it true, however, that difficulties have arisen because both men and women, when placed in positions of decision and leadership and, and rule, have sometimes behaved as tyrants and taskmasters and have become unreasonable. And I don't know that every parent would feel, looking back over the years, that they always acted the best way with their children. And some parents live with lifelong regrets about what they did or they didn't do. They were too strict or they were too liberal and would to God they had been different. I can imagine, though I cannot know what they feel. But of course, uh, then we may comfort ourselves somewhat, man, where, at least it seems to me, uh, if we think how this matter of the Lordship of Christ works. You will perhaps say, do always have to obey in the situation if you happen to be one of the left-hand side, uh, suppose your parents ask you to do something that is wrong. Do you have to obey them? Well, no, not if it is contrary to God's law, do you? The teenagers in Malaysia, for instance, when they find the Saviour through hearing the Gospel may be in their Christian union at school or in the university, and then go home, have to face this practical question many, many times, as their parents demand that they take part in the household worship of the God. What is the teenager to do? It is uh, a very difficult situation to be faced, isn't it? And one will often be, be asked in Malaysia by such people, what ought I to do in order best to commend the gospel? Obviously, there are situations where we must obey God rather than man. And if the person in charge of us, so to speak, is demanding that we do something contrary to God's holy word, then we have to obey the Lord rather than men. But does that mean at the other extreme, that if the person, so to speak, in charge, that has to take the decision, asks me to do something that I don't like to do, I can always say, no, I'm not going to do that, because I don't think the Lord would have me do it. You know, the father says to 14-year-old, now, you're not going out uh, to play football yet again. You're going to stay in and help mother with the housework, you'll see. And 14-year-old says, uh, why should I? George down the road, his parents don't make him stay behind and help his mother and do the housework, and I don't think God would have me stay in. Well, if it's open to the people in the left-hand group always to decide, then why do we have any control at all? Surely the Lordship of Christ will mean that the people that God appoints as leaders in their various groups do have authority to decide. And if we who are to obey are asked to do something that we feel we don't like, but if it's not contrary to the Word of God, it's for us to obey rather than to decide, isn't it? You say, wouldn't that fill life with a horrible uh, 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 and distressing bondage? Well, would it? Let's take the extreme case of the slaves and listen to what Paul says to them. Slaves, obey in all things them that are your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleaser, pleasers, but in singleness of heart, serving the law. That is, the slave is not merely to look to the master that is over him, but beyond that master to the master, the law. Suppose the earthly master asks him to do unpleasant things and is unreasonable. Yet if he really believes that behind that master stands the Lord himself, 
He can do it unto the Lord, can't he? And would he grudge doing it to the Lord? How many unpleasant things did the Lord do for you, friend? And what is more, if we do it for the Lord, says Paul, you'll see, doing it heartily as unto the Lord, from the Lord we shall get the reward anyway. He measures not merely we have done what we have done, but what it cost us to do it, and for his sake to do things that we felt were unreasonable and unpleasant. But we did it for the Lord's sake. We shall get the reward of the inheritance. You'll see, we shall all reign with Christ. We shan't all have equal responsibility, shall we? And the people who will have the most responsibility are the people that have learned to obey the Lord most. And of course, if we misbehave, the Lordship of Christ is a real thing. For he that does wrong may expect to receive discipline from the Lord now and lack of reward in the day to come. So that a real vigorous faith in the Lordship of Christ, it seems to me, instead of making life more difficult for the slave, would in fact make it easier. So presumably it is in all the other relationships of life, a vivid faith that sees that behind those whom God's providence has put in charge of us, behind them stands the Lord himself, and that I may work for the Lord. Takes out of the difficult situations in life some of their smart, and in their place puts the balm of knowing that I work for the most reasonable of masters. I may serve the Lord. Thank you for listening to Biblical Insights with David Gooding. If you're interested in more of Dr. Gooding's teachings, check out our other podcast series or visit our website, myrtlefieldhouse.com, for free ebooks, sermons, and study notes.